Hi class and welcome to week four. Uh, this week we're going to be focusing on policy and how to, in, to implement policy so that everything that we do complies with the outcomes expected by management. At the highest level we have the security program. The security program consists of policy, standards, guidelines, procedures, training, and awareness. The security program is also something that we should have reviewed by a third party on an on a regular basis to make sure that we haven't left any gaps. Policy applies at security at three levels. Issue, system, and enterprise. Issue is how a user should behave in a specific situation. System applies to a system like payroll or to the financials and deals with technology, with people issues, and with processes specific to that system. And enterprise policies reply to the entire enterprise and regardless of issue or system involved. Standards are things that we must do to comply with policy. Guidelines are recommendations for things to do, for ways to get to outcomes. Guidelines are things that are recommendations on how to get to an outcome, but technical and business employees can work together to find more creative ways to reach the outcomes that may be better than what's defined in the guideline itself. Procedures are step-by-step -step processes that allow users to consistently achieve compliance with policy without having to think about the policy, as long as they follow the procedures given them, they will always be compliant. And training and awareness. Training is necessary to ensure users understand the importance of, tra of security and to ensure that they understand how policy, standards, guidelines, and procedures apply to them and their daily work. Awareness is a continuous process that keeps the management's expectations of employee behavior front and center at all times. In general, a policy is a statement of organization's position. The purpose of the policy is to influence behavior. And that includes not just the business users in their day-to-day -day tasks, but it also includes tech technology people and how they design technology, uh, networks, software, uh, and also how they ensure that information is being handled in the right ways. Policies specify outcomes expected by management, and outcomes are usually directly impacted by regulations, stakeholder and customer, and also employee expectations of privacy and uh, proper ethical and regulatory control of information, and then finally ethics. Ethical conduct is doing what is right, regardless of whether a law covers it or not. Policies specify what, not how. Again, policies are looking at outcomes. They're not looking at how you get there. That's the role of standards, guidelines, and procedures. Developed by representatives from all affected groups, we never want to leave out business users or first-line managers from policy definition. The worst thing that can be done is for management, high-level management, C-level management, to sit in a room, develop policy, or IT, sit in a room and develop policy without input from the people that have to actually live with it. Um, we have to be able to enforce policy. It has to be something that the business can live with. If policy is too restrictive, then management is going to cause its employees to bypass the policy. And this goes to our last bullet, which is approved and supported by management. Senior management need to support the policies. They need to sign off on them. And they need to make sure that managers at all levels and employees understand that they expect compliance. It also must be supported by management at all levels. Management support is the is the behavior of managers that ensures that the users are 
following procedures every day, and if they don't, taking steps to correct that behavior. And as I mentioned earlier, if a policy is too restrictive and management cannot reach their productivity goals by following the policy, there's going to be significant drift from what is expected. Going Digging a little bit deeper into policy content, statement it's a statement of management's position relative to the system issue or mission base that's enterprise outcomes expected or required and it also contains a list of people responsible for managing the policy and its enforcement the worst thing that can be done with anything that needs to be managed is to throw it in the middle of a room and hope somebody picks it up it must be very specific so these people are responsible for maintaining the content maintain modifying modifying the policy as outcomes change based on regulatory and other issues and finally sanctions what sanctions apply if a user does not comply with policy usually human resources already has sanctions in place a disciplinary uh, program in place for users not complying with company policy in general and those uh, typically apply to security policies as well Whenever we do write policy, we have to check and make sure that the outcomes are what we expected. Just because we write policy and we think that they're going to result in a world that we envision does not mean that that will actually happen. So we need to determine the effectiveness of the execution of information security policy. We have to determine the effectiveness and efficiency of the delivery of information security services. And we have to assess the impact of an incident or other security event on the organization or its mission. In other words, we have to always be looking at ways, we always have to be looking at the outcomes that were expected in comparison to what is actually happening. And we need to do that in a formal basis, not just getting up each morning, going to work and say, okay, you know, are we compliant with policies today? It needs to be a formal process. Uh, like auditing or bringing in third parties to look at policy and and uh, what you're actually doing and making sure that there's no gaps between those two things. The methods again of of ensuring policy outcomes are penetration tests, response testing and root cause analysis and audits. Penetration tests uh, we're going to get to and in in audits we'll get to in a little bit um, but response testing and root cause analysis is the process of finding the the cause the the main cause of any incident security incident and mitigating it so root cause analysis is necessary after every incident occurs and it applies to both missed controls and to how the organization can respond better in the future. Metrics are usually a some kind of a uh, measure against the standard that says, okay, this is where we are against that standard. The problem with security and metrics is that security is trying to prevent something from happening as opposed to uh, trying to make something happen. So measuring that is difficult. Compliance and certification is not necessarily security. So if we if we get certified or we pass an audit, that doesn't mean that we're secure. And all it means is that we're compliant with regulations, we follow standards of best practice to the letter, and we have we are also following well-designed standards and guidelines. Again, that does not mean that we are secure. The best test is to look at the network from an attacker's perspective and auditing for outcomes expected by policy or expected by management's development of the policy. One of the best ways to do that is with a penetration test. So we're going to go through this definition. This is a very good definition of what a pen test is. It's a proactive and authorized attempt. Now authorized is very important because you never do a penetration test unless the target organization's management has approved it and they have approved the extent to which you will go. For example, a penetration test may be approved by management to only go in and find the gaps and 
lists the ways that a that an attacker might exploit those gaps or those vulnerabilities. On the other hand, management may want you to go all the way in to a system, compromise the system, but not do anything that would bring the system down during uh, the business day or when the processes on that server, for example, are, are required. So again, uh, authorization of the extent of the testing and uh, exactly at w to what level the test can go. So a penetration test is a proactive and authorized attempt to evaluate the security of an IT infrastructure by safely attempting to exploit system vulnerabilities, including OS, service and application flaws, improper configurations, and even risk behavior. Uh, a lot of penetration tests can, in can include social engineering. Such assessments are also useful in validating the efficacy or efficiency or the effectiveness of defensive mechanisms, as well as end users' adherence to security policies. So a penetration test can cover a wide variety of, of outcomes, but it's really looking at things from an attacker's perspective. So a lot of times it's going to be focused squarely on getting to a critical system from either externally or internally, or both. In the past, when I've done, had penetration tests done, I had the test done against two or three critical systems, uh, testing the, the attack paths to get to those systems and making sure that they were blocked. You'll find that if you design your controls effectively so that each control handles issues for multiple systems or multiple attack paths, that making a change in one place will often apply that change across all other systems. And so you don't have to test every single thing to ensure that you have the right controls in place and that attack paths are blocked. Audits are very important. Um, they, measure to, they measure outcomes. Now here's a very important piece. Audits measure outcomes. They do not measure process necessarily. What they do is they look at a company's policy and standards and guidelines and say okay this is what the company expects the outcomes to be then it goes to the other end beyond procedure and checks to make sure that those outcomes are actually happening. We're going to get involved in this a little bit later next week. Do not confuse an audit with a risk assessment. They are not the same thing. A risk assessment is looking for gaps. It's looking at a network from a um, a network or an application from an attacker's perspective. An audit is looking at it from a management perspective. It's looking at outcomes to determine whether or not what we think we're doing, we're actually doing. There are two types of audits, internal and external. Internal audits are done by internal audit teams. They do testing on a regular basis so that the annual, usually annual, external audit is clean and there are no material deficiencies to report to the board of directors. External audits are typically done by people like Ernst & Young, one of the big accounting firms. Now we're going to talk a little bit about employee risk and this will lead us into our final topic for, for uh, this week which is uh, training and awareness. So this first, first statement here is very important. Employees are the largest attack surface. Our attack surfaces are normally managed by con managing configurations of our controls, our devices, and once configured, they act in a consistent manner. People don't act that way. People don't always act in the way that we expect. That makes them our biggest attack surface. And they are our biggest vulnerability. Employee vulnerabilities examples include social engineering, and the social engineering can include phishing, which is uh, and spear phishing, which is getting employees to do something that they ordinarily wouldn't, but is to the benefit of an attacker. It either culminates, it either achieves a final objective, or achieves an interim step moving toward the final objective. Phishing is a general is a general uh, approach. Spear phishing only goes after specific people in the company and uh, many times that's C-level 
managers who have been given significant access, incorrectly I might add, and they just attacking one, just be able to successfully attack one of those, successfully fish one of those people, might give access to the entire organization. And masquerading is pretending you're somebody you're not. And uh, an attacker can pretend they're someone, uh, gain physical access to a building, and like we've talked about before, physic once there's physical access, game over. Once an attacker has physical access to a device, to your network, they can do whatever they want, regardless of what controls you have in place. The only thing they can save you at that point is effective monitoring and log management. Also, employees could fuel dumpster diving. Dumpster diving is uh, an attacker going into the trash that you put outside and pulling out sensitive information or information that will enable the attacker to move to the next phase in an attack. Dumpster diving is part of the, infor the information gathering phase of an attack. One way to prevent this from happening is to to have a to put a policy in place that it, that requires users to place sensitive data in hard copy into locked receptacles. Those locked receptacles are moved to the curb, picked up by a special uh, disposal organization where the 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 uh, documentation is destroyed. Uh, in those situations, dumpster diving is ineffective. But again. Employees have to comply with the policy to put the information into the locked receptacles. Employee risk also comes from carelessness. Employees failing to follow a procedure step by step and missing a key step in the, in the procedure that opens, opens an attack path that wouldn't ordinarily exist. Employee ignorance of policy. This, this is closely related to following procedures. If employees are ignorant, if they don't understand the policies that exist, why they're important, why security is important, then they're more apt to be very lax on their compliance with procedures. So it's important to make sure that they understand the policies and why they're important. And finally, we have revenge or social activism. Employees who think the company has not treated them fairly, or employees who believe the company is violating a social activist position that they have taken uh, are, are a very real danger to, a, to an organization. Closely related to revenge is uh, an employee stealing information or doing things to the organization in response for payment. The reason it's closely related is employees who are lo have some loyalty to the organization, uh, a sense of ethics in how they respond to the to the people who actually sign their paychecks, uh, helps to prevent those times types of activities. So now we're going to dive a little deeper into training and awareness. Training is is the bringing of people into an into a room and explaining the purpose of security and why it's important and how it affects each of them personally. The best way to train an employee is to show them how security is important to them, not just to the organization. Uh, this can be done by um, not just by letting them know what sanctions can be applied if they don't follow policy. That's like beating them over the head with a stick. But it can also be shown by, it can also be done by demonstrating how the things that they're learning about security affect them when they're at home or using their personal devices anywhere on the road. Training also shows their, the, uh, demonstrates the employee's role in security, what's expected of them, how an attacker might leverage them to reach their objectives. And finally, policy standards and guidelines. Employees must be familiar with them, not just familiar with them on a and how they read but familiar with them and how they apply or how they affect the user what does a policy and standard and guideline mean to an employee's day-to-day -day workload 
So that's a translation step that that is necessary to for training to be for training for policies for standards procedures to be effective. Then you have awareness. Awareness is usually not in the classroom. It's use of posters, newsletters that that are that are used throughout the organization on a daily, weekly basis that keep front and center the principles learned in the training program. And training needs to be focused on a specific audience. In an organization, there are three main audiences. You have your employees, your managers, and IT. Employees, we're talking about business employees, non-IT business employees. Their view of policies is Okay, how, how, what do I have to do differently when I sit in front of my computer or when I'm interacting with, with others? What do I have to do differently? Well, how does my behavior have to change to be policy compliant? That's really the focus of employee training. Management training concludes what's important to employees, but it also includes how, what's expected of them to ensure compliance. What is it that managers need to do to make sure that employees are properly following procedure? And what are the steps to take if they find that they're not? And what are some things they look for to determine whether outcomes are being properly achieved between audits? And finally, there's IT. IT is also broken down in employees and managers for the same reasons as, as the business employees. But IT also has a, in addition to the other things that, that the business employees and managers need to know, IT needs to understand how standards, guidelines, and policies affect how they design, implement, and deli deliver technology and processes to various parts of the business. What is allowed, what is not allowed, what are some of the things that they need to consider when they go into a project working with the business uh, and, and to determine if the business is asking for A, is A possible based on policies, standards, and guidelines? And if not, what is the best way to help the business achieve their outcomes without doing something without doing the thing that's going to cause a lot of risk for the business. So for example, the business may want uh, additional access for a new position, a new role in, a, in the department, uh, which is actually going to give way too much access, access to way too much information. Uh, it could violate the HIPAA, for example. So what, techno what the technology or the IT people need to do is to find a way to deliver the proper information to the, to the new role without violating any regulatory constraints. And finally, this is a graphic showing the training and awareness process. It consists of planning, knowing who your audience is, and what, what is you're trying to uh, achieve, the deployment of the training, the bringing the people into rooms, developing your deployment, your uh, lesson plans, and delivering the training, assessing the training, making sure that people that you're achieving the outcomes that you expect, and this can be part of your regular security assessments, responding to the results of the assessments, and maintenance, modifying your training and your awareness processes to to bring the results closer to the outcomes you expect. And that's it for this week. Uh, be sure to read all your assigned material. And uh, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to ask.